just after I had been appointed uh, to be the head of policy planning at the State Department. And uh, at the time, I was working with Peter Tarnoff, who was the Under Secretary for Political Affairs. And uh, Peter said to me, you know, we really should spend a little more time thinking about India. He said, let's go. And so uh, in the spring of 94, Peter and I came uh, to Delhi uh, to inaugurate the first policy planning talks between um, the MEA uh, and uh, the United States. And uh, the goal was to have a strategic dialogue. Um, and uh, I won't pretend to you that it was very substantively successful, but it reflected, I think, a, a recognition which has been a longstanding recognition in the United States that there was something missing in the US-Indian relationship and that, that surely more was possible than what we had been able to achieve. And I can say with confidence, and this is not you know, a tribute to one administration or any others, but really lots of work of lots of people over a very long period of time, that if you look back at the state of U.S.-Indian relations in 93 and 94 compared to today, it is a dramatic and wonderfully successful story. The, 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 the transformation from one of suspicion and wariness and sort of who's, what are you trying to do here and what's this all about anyway, which greeted us when we first came, um, is gone. And there, is a, there are lots of issues and lots of complexities in the relationship. But there's just no dispute anymore about how important the relationship and the need to have a sustained dialogue across a broad range of issues. And I credit all of the administrations, from the Clinton administration, which I served in, to the Bush administration, and the enormous breakthrough with the nuclear deal, to what we tried to do in the Obama administration, and now with President Trump. So that trajectory is a very positive and very important one. And I think that, that it reflects a broad bipartisan consensus in the United States about the centrality of this relationship uh, for a full range of issues. I always teach my students there are three baskets, right? There's security, economics, and values, and this is important across all three. That's my first point. My second point is to try to think and reflect a bit on what's just happened the last week. Um, so one of the great things about coming to visit here is I get to read your newspapers and, and your commentary, at least the English uh, uh, print. And so I've been reading all the stories and all the commentary. And my favorite observation, which I, I read uh, the other day, was uh, in talking about the joint statement that was um, issued, that one of the commentators described it as semantically significant. <laughs> I thought that was a great expression, uh, because, because we have this new comprehensive global strategic partnership. And so I think the real question now is, indisputably, the relationship has been deepening over time across a broad range of issues. But are, are we really at a different stage? And what would, that, what would it mean for us to be at, at a different stage? And there are two things that have uh, uh, sort of stood out for me as I've reflected it since I arrived here. Um, the first uh, of the, is a, a statement in the joint statement, not the global strategic partnership, but this idea of strategic convergence, right, which is very striking. Um, because if it is true that there's a strategic convergence between the United States and India. When then one asks the question, well, a strategic convergence about what? What, what is the strategy of which, around which we converge? And the, for me, that's a big question mark. And I, and I think that we don't, re, I mean, the, the two leaders have said we have a strategic convergence, but what is the strategy that we both share, both vis-a-vis -vis this region, China, and the world? Um, and does India really share President Trump's strategic vision to the extent that he has one, which so far as I can tell is a vision of America first. And, and how, what would it mean for India to have convergence around Trump's view about each nation being for itself and out to achieve its own goals? If that's what we've converged about, which is possible, that has a lot of implications for where the relationship goes, but also the limits of the relationship. If, if it's every country first for itself, that's a form of strategic convergence, but it's not necessarily the form for a global comprehensive partnership. That's the first observation. The second, which is equally significant, my perspective was not from the joint statement, but by a statement by the prime minister, who said, uh, at least according to the papers, that uh, he described the U.S.-India relationship as the most important relationship of the century. And that's quite a significant statement, too. It's, uh, we were talking about the history of, of Indian foreign policy uh, over the last 60 years, and um, 70 years. Uh, and you know, it is, it's quite stunning to think about in the context of the, the traditional Indian foreign policy to describe the relationship with the United States as the most important relationship of the century. Right? It is a, it is a commitment to a kind of relationship and an alignment 
which historically has not been the case for India. And so the, the signal of that sense is a very powerful one uh, about the, the fundamental importance that at least the prime minister puts on this relationship and the willingness to proclaim to all the other partners that India has that America comes first. And to the extent that that's true, that is a change. Uh, and has big significance for, I think, the evolution of this region. And so I'd be interested, uh, Shankar, in your views about that and whether this does really reflect a significant departure for India now in terms of thinking about its orientation towards the United States and the world. So perfect, perfectly timed. Uh, and before uh, Shankar starts, just a couple of takeaways from what you said. One, you said 93, you were heading policy planning. Yep. I think the period 93, 98, the five years was the worst five years in Thank you. In the post-Cold War history of Indo-US relations, so you had your job cut out. Uh, because that was mostly Clinton won, ending with nuclear tests and the uh, sanctions. Uh, that's one. Second, you talked about semantically significant. So people, uh, people who write about uh, these diplomatic things which sound so complex anyway, and where journalists don't know anything about <laughs> what's going on, uh, people write innovative stuff. So my favorite line of all times is Tashkent, the agreement in 1966, one of our most eminent diplomatic correspondents, the kind of which has not yet been, never yet been again, nor will be, uh, described the handshake between Ayub and Lal Bahadur Shastri as a Himalayan handshake. Now, we know that he meant it to be a compliment, but you know, it wasn't very warm. <laughs> I can... <laughs> I can tell you that. And third thing, you were searching for strategic convergence, so it's a little facetious, but I'll say, given the way today's leaders are, strategic convergence and the shared strategic objective might just be to help each other win their election. <laughs> so, having said that, Shankar, you thank speak you, the Jim. serious thank stuff. Thank you, Jim. Thanks for that. I, you know, right through what you were saying, I was thinking, my job's easy. All I have to say is I agree with Jim <laughs> until the end when you ask <laughs> questions. Of, but what I'd like to do is to add to what you said, because I think we've been lucky in the India-US relationship in this whole transformation. Would not have been possible if we didn't have people like you who conceptualized the relationship, who saw, it, who could intellectualize about it. Uh, so now you can therefore afford to support each other's elections, do the tactical stuff, and a lot of the hard work has already been done. But I'm, I'm still an optimist, and not just still, I, I'm a long-term optimist, but even in the short term, because for me, convergence has actually grown over time. And now that we're willing to say so, to admit it, we've thought it for a long time, I think. Otherwise, we wouldn't have done the nuclear deal. We wouldn't have done all the things we did. Uh, and the US wouldn't be the biggest partner in terms of military exercise, a huge source of defense equipment. You know, we wouldn't have the kind of interoperability now that we have, all this counterterrorism, you name it. We work together in a whole host of sensitive things. We wouldn't have arrived here if we didn't actually think we had convergence. I think the problem is that in the public mind, convergence is China. And we've been there before. You know, if you look at the late Eisenhower's, well, the end of Eisenhower's administration and the beginning of JFK's, uh, and relations went up, but then, you know, by the mid 60s, Vietnam War, a whole series of domestic things in India, and it went down. And this time is different. And I mean, Tanvi Madan's book, which is the PhD you made her do, I think, I mean, that argues the case very well. But if you look at us today, actually this relationship walks on many legs now. It's not just China or the view of the region. When we say Indo-Pacific, I think it's a, it's a sort of inchoate expression of the kind of region we'd want, an open region which is not centered on any one power where, and I think that's actually coming about. If you look at the distribution of power in the Asia Pacific, it, it's not just China that's rising, there are other powers rising as well, and the balance of power is shifting very rapidly, but it's shifted in favor of several other countries. So it is a more multipolar system, at least in this part of Asia, India eastwards. Uh, and that's one point of fundamental convergence. We now have an economic relationship that really matters. We've gone from, what, $11 billion in 1995 to, to now to you're a, the US is our biggest trading partner. Uh, we, 
There are things, I think, where we need to be a little more coordinated. But these are not new problems. Iran, for instance. Uh, we've, even during the Bush administration, when they were pushing against Iran international sanctions, but the Bush administration saw the point, from our point of view, that we needed to do Chabahar, we needed access to Central Asia, Afghanistan, and was willing to turn a blind eye to what, what was going on. I'm not sure if that has changed today in the US. But as long as we cut each other enough slack to deal with issues like that, where we might have a slightly different emphasis. We don't sit behind the two biggest oceans in the world. So we don't have the luxury that you have. Uh, for us, if anything goes wrong around Iran in the Gulf, seven million Indians work there, that's, that would be disastrous, the, the consequences. So there are issues like that, but it seems to me we now have developed enough habits of cooperation that we can handle these things. Uh, and from what I can see, in terms of maritime security, the whole maritime domain, I think there's much more that we're doing together than we've ever done before, and, and that's only going to grow. I don't see that diminishing. Uh, so I'm, I'm a long-term optimist. Now, there will be hiccups, and I think the problems come when either of us decides we want a monogamous marriage, you know. Uh, this is where, if we say, don't talk to Pakistan, or, you know, the U.S. says, don't you dare talk to Iran, or, you know, and we will have differences, I think, on, on Russia, for instance. But I think we can live with all this. Certainly for, for Indians, we're used to multiple identities and to a whole different set of, you know, a plural sort of world. So I, I don't think there's anything that I can see right now that can actually reverse this. Uh, I, I think now, where should India be in this from an Indian point of view? You know, even from a, if you were Bismarck, I mean, you would say India should be uh, closer to both the U.S. and China than they are to each other. I mean, that's the logical, I mean, I guess Kissinger would probably say that too. But that's the cold one. That doesn't include the values, the other things, uh, the Indian diaspora and the U.S., a whole set of other factors. I mean, people send real, sell real estate in Gurgaon here with, you know, Palm Beach, Orange County, what does it tell you? It tells you there's a middle class out there. By the way, in Bangalore, they have 110 Downing Street also. <laughs> <laughs> it's an apartment building. That's ambition. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, therefore, I'm, I'm an optimist. And I'm just trying to list all the things to support what you said. And I just uh, finish the thought. I mean, I, I think that, that my only concern is that that perception or that characterization that you've just given is understood on our side, right? Because I, you know, there, there's a well, risk. Even if it isn't, you've got, luckily you've got checks and balances. That's true. So if <clears throat> one part of the system is not working, there's always a, 10 other places. I mean, there are people sitting in this room who've actually built this relationship, Sham, Navtej, and I'm sure he spent a lot of time wandering around town, going around the states, doing, you know, working with corporations with whoever. It's so uh, each one of you, just spend one minute giving your definition of what you see as the strategic convergence. I, I like Shanker's characterization, which is that, that I think that the one thing that is broadly shared in the American strategic community is this idea of an open international system in which, which no one uh, dominates and that there is freedom of countries to pursue their interests without coercion, without uh, others trying to um, impose their will. And I think that that is, is a very strong basis for shared convergence, because it isn't uh, one of, of anybody trying to dictate the order, but rather recognition that, that the, the order has to be open to a variety of perspectives. It's also attractive if taken in those terms, because it isn't necessarily an anti-China thing. It's, it sets the rules of the system, which China can decide to either participate in or resist, but it's an, op it's an open, <coughs> feel for China, to, if it accepts the idea of an open Indo-Pacific, to participate in it. So I think that's an opportunity for a strategic convergence uh, that can be broadly shared and puts us on the high ground uh, for leadership based on the rule of law and respect for a diversity of views. And, and if, it, it then allows us to exert both global leadership as well as regional. 
Shankar? Well, as I said, for me, it's the open system, it's the idea of a... The, I think the problem is that we're used, so used to the Cold War that we now think that Sino-U.S. contention is back to U.S.-Soviet, which it isn't. Uh, I don't think China can be contained by anybody today. Uh, I don't... I mean, the U.S. and China are linked... Because, because China is a much, much bigger economic power than the, the Soviet world. Union ever was. And she's also part of the world, world economy. Yeah. I mean, she's a big factor in the world economy, which the Soviet Union never was on that scale at all. And so... I think for all of us, I mean, this is really an intertwined, globalized world for the first time. And in that kind of world, I think it's important that you actually work to keep it open. So, you know, uh, more than half our GDP is the external sector. And how, how many Indians realize that? Absolutely. And, and it's, it's, in fact, you said, you said uh, Indo-US trade was 11 billion. I think if no, I remember... No, it started at 11 it billion. It started at 11 billion. No, no, I think it's 140, 40 something now. Yeah. yeah. And, and they're aiming for it to be 400 billion, so it's, it, it's, a, it's a lot. Yeah. But that's also because how India's economy uh, changed after 1991, uh, some of which might be reversed as we look, as, as, we see, as we see the new nationalism. Now, there is an issue here. The issue is that in India, uh, this government has come in, it's at least there for four and a half years, right? I mean, to say that in the city that it's there for four and a half years, would sound like I'm predicting it won't be there after that, but I'm saying at least four and a half years, okay. right? Uh, in the U.S., we don't know what happens. We, we can't be sure. Well, some people have, bet, have made a bet already. Yes. So, so that's the question. One, is that the right bet to make? Uh, because as a journalist, as a political journalist, I would never call an election. Because when journalists call an election, they are exactly the opposite is bound to happen. Right? So I... So I don't know if you, uh, if you uh, pundits are better uh, with experience. <laughs> Second, uh, this is not a Republican administration in America. It's a Trump administration. So uh, how strong Trump is? In any case, he can't be there for an, uh, more than four and a half years. I'm saying Modi there at least four and a half years. Trump there not longer than four and a half years. After which some normalcy returns in America. So. <laughs> So, uh, so how do you, I mean, how institutional are these commitments now when bipartisanship seems to be dying? And if I may push the envelope, when our government at this point seems to have dismissed bipartisanship as an obsolete idea. So, each one of you. So, I... I I think it's a huge... You can disagree with anything no, no, no. I'm saying. I mean, I, 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 it's not a question of predicting what's going to happen. I think that even if, if the leadership here were confident that Trump was being reelected, the worst thing you could do is to bet on one party or the other, simply because they, the long-term strength depends on, on the relationship not being seen as a loyalty to one party. Um, it, it damages the, the, the sustainability of the relationship to do that. And so, I mean, I have no problem with, uh, and I, would, I welcome the fact that the leadership here gives our sitting president a warm welcome. It should give a sitting president, but it shouldn't be seen as campaigning for that president. And I think that's, and, and the Congress is equally true. I mean, I think one of the things, and it was a challenge for us uh, when, when we came into office with President Obama, there were lots of questions about, about Mr. Modi and about you know, the issues that, that are debated here. But you know, one of the things you have to accept, especially in a democracy, is that you don't, we don't get to pick. Um, and I think the, one of the strengths of what we did during the Obama administration was to respect that choice that was made here. And so I think it's really critical to the long-term relationship that, um, that the leadership here doesn't tie the relationship to the fortunes of one particular candidate or one particular party. I couldn't agree more. I've said in public before that I... I think we need no, this is to dangerous, but in case the Americans Trump. agree on everything like well, this. this is the transformed <laughs> relationship. <laughs> this is the binary. <laughs> this is congruence. <laughs> right. Uh, strategic, what? Global, comprehensive, comprehensive global, global strategic, strategic partnership. partnership. In action. No, I, I think we've, some of the things we've done recently maybe have affected that, but I think we need to work to bring it back to bipartisanship, not only in the U.S., but in India as well. Now, we've had divisions. And I, I think it might be you know, easier to do it in the U.S. than India. I'm not sure. You think back to the civil nuclear and a vote of confidence and what the BJP was saying about the civil nuclear deal in the opposition. And the moment they came to power, suddenly... This is like Jahangir wonderful. invited the British in, so India became a slave of Britain for 200 years. That is what was said. 
by Sushma Swaraj in Parliament mm. on the nuclear deal. Yeah, on the nuclear deal, yes. Yeah. But I mean, they once they came to power, they were reasonable, and I think that's the point. If if you're Democrats at home, then you understand that you you will have to deal with all sorts of people. But these Democrats are more ideological now. Let's see what as the Chinese have a good saying. Yeah. I mean, listen to their words, but watch what they do. Yeah. Yeah. That's an important one. So. Something that's always fascinated me: Clinton one and Clinton two. You were there. So from the worst possible relationship to this dramatic turnaround, uh, the easing of the sanctions, the uh, and then this big honeymoon and Clinton coming up here within a year of the nuclear test and wagging his finger at the Pakistanis and saying that long, lines on the map of the world, of the subcontinent, cannot be redrawn in blood. What happened? So because I, then we will know how Washington changes. I mean, but I, I, you know, I, I mean, it's it's history, but it's worth going back to the history, which is that President Clinton, from the outset, and I can say this with confidence, having been there from the outset, really aspired to have a stronger relationship with India. But he also had a very strong commitment to the, the nuclear non-proliferation regime, and there was a tension there, and it was it was a a problem that was a difficult problem to square the circles on, which is at a time when we were focused on the end of the Soviet Union, trying to make sure that we had written a final chapter with the, the uh, bringing the Ukrainian nukes back, the Kazakhstan nukes back, trying to move to an, a, a less nuclear world, uh, to pursue that agenda and to pursue an agenda with um, India, and, and the desire to try to do both at the same time, which pro proved unsustainable. The tensions between the two, and ultimately a choice had to be made. And I think it tells you a lot about President Clinton that at the end of the day, when the choice had to be made, he chose for the relationship and not for the kind of purity around the NPT. Um, it was a hard decision for him because it was something that was important to him and important to people in his administration. You take somebody like Bill Perry, who had a strong commitment to India, but also had a deep, from his own experience, strong commitment to the NPT. And so for the first five years, we tried to ride both horses, a, you know, kind of a very strong principal commitment to not undermining the NPT and trying to build a relationship with India. It proved impossible, uh, and it all fell apart in 98, and we saw it all fall apart in 98. And then I think it's to the credit of the president that he said, I, you know, it's kind of productive for me to continue to do this. What's happened has happened. We need to move on from here. And I think, you know, he, in some ways he was liberated by that to be able to say, okay, I, I tried to sustain a, a, a more principled view of the NPT, but it's not going to happen. I can adjust the realities. And now there is an opportunity to move forward with the bilateral relationship. So uh, let's stay in Washington. How is a Trump policy-making establishment different from any other? Because there's no policy-making establishment. There's, there's... <laughs> <laughs> so, so how does this work? I mean, any commitments made, any promises made? Because he can go, he can change them any time. But today he's talking to North Korea, tomorrow he's fighting with North Korea, today he's fighting with China, uh, tomorrow he's not fighting with China, today he's breaking talks with the Taliban, tomorrow he's signing up with Taliban. But you know, he'll be the only US president in this century, in fact, for, for a long time, who wouldn't have started a new war. So I think this image of Trump as being unpredictable, dangerous, I think he's fundamentally conservative. He wants to bring the troops home. He has, OK, let's not say he has a vision or he has a grand plan and strategy, but he certainly has instincts. So, and those instincts, from an Indian point of view, are not all bad. Many of the things he said, improve relations with the Russians, get the troops home, end the war, these are sensible things that he's saying. Mm. Uh, the trouble is he says it in ways which you know, arouse all kinds of opposition. But he wants retweets. And he makes it, so yeah. he, he needs retweets. So no, he has to say I these things in his own way. I think we stop analyzing Trump the way we used to analyze previous cerebral presidents. I think we need to look at it differently. Well, I think uh, <laughs> similarly we should stop analyzing Mr. Modi uh, exactly. as we used to analyze the previous, maybe not as cerebral prime ministers. I think I'm okay with but that. I, I, you know, I, I, I certainly agree. I mean, I do, I do think that he is, he is significantly risk averse. And, and we've seen this, look at the, the issues around Iran. You mentioned Iran. I mean, you have a very strong rhetorical position here. Um, but, 
every time we've come to the brink of potential confrontation, right, he's pulled back. And so I, I agree with that. I, I don't, I mean, there are many things that I fundamentally disagree with the president, but I don't think he's reckless. I think he actually understands that the, that the single biggest threat to his reelection is getting us involved in a war. And so, you know, why does he continue to praise the, where we're going with North Korea after we've made no progress at all? It's because he doesn't need this to be a crisis. So I, I agree with that. I think the problem, though, and I think it should be considered to be a problem here, and I'll be blunt about this one, is that the, at the heart of his view is something he's very explicit about, which is this idea of America first, which is we're in this for ourselves, and we will do for us. And he has a pretty narrow conception of what that is, which is best for ourselves, which means that even for countries with whom we have very strong, important, shared interest, um, they don't get very special consideration. You know, and, and you see what's happened in our relationship with other key traditional partners of the United States. And there doesn't seem to be a lot of sense of the fact that, yes, you can go for some short-term gains, but what does that do to the long-term relationship? And so we'll see what happens uh, in the U.S.-Indian relationship. But it is, it has been difficult for our traditional partners, especially our values partners, like Europeans, like Japan, like Korea, like Australia, to you know, have the confidence that, that we will take into account those broader shared interests as we develop the relationship. And so that's the one feature that I think is consistent about the president, which is, you know, it's, what have you done for me lately? Yeah. But this is the problem we today have across the world. With most of the new authoritarians, they have no performance legitimacy because they make huge promises, don't deliver. And therefore, they rely on nationalism, ultranationalism, xenophobia for their legitimacy. And so it's not just, you know, an and, India and, US and, problem. And local populism. And local, well, populism, no, because then you're handing them the populace. So that's a wrong word, I think. But anyway, that's a different argument. So it seems to me the problem is that the space for negotiation, <laughs> diplomacy, for the give and take, the bargaining, that, that is an essential part of peaceful resolution of issues, is, is actually shrunk okay. because of this. And it's not only in the US. I mean, Trump is actually the last of the series that started in 2012. Yep. And, you know, going west from Japan to China to us to everywhere. So it's, it's a more general systemic problem now. And that, I think we have to just take it as part of the environment, the new environment. Will but it's Therefore, we will solve nothing. But we can hope to manage because they're risk averse, because their own, they have tied foreign policy into domestic politics which cuts the foreign policy elite out, but at least it restrains them from getting into, into the kinds of wars and things that interventions that uh, their predecessors used to do. So let me push you on this point. Uh, you're saying Trump has cut the foreign policy elites out. Not, him, not just him. I mean, all of them. And all of them, hard including work, Mr. Uh, Modi. You know, I mean, yes, hard work, not Harvard. But uh, <laughs> he is, I think, what he said. But then yes, you, look where, yes. you look where the whole... BJP, RSS, leadership sends their children to study. Well, I mean, we, we ran that story we yesterday, it, yes. and we, I'm paying for it since last night, because <laughs> I'm being trolled and trolled and trolled and trolled, uh, including by minister's right. children saying, look at me, I got such good marks, I got to this place on my own. And you so to which my reply should have been, and I'm holding fire, my reply should have been, then why are your parents ruining the two or three great universities we have? out of which most of them came, so, because they can afford to see their children go to five universities overseas, which they can't ruin. But anyway, that was, that's, a, uh, that's a digression. We've come uh, 32 minutes into this session. Uh, one, uh, we'll soon take questions from the audience, so please uh, keep them ready. Uh, but se second, 32 minutes into a 60-minute discussion on Indo-US relations, and no P word and no A word. Uh, Either we've had too much to eat at lunch, or the world has really changed. So Pakistan and Afghanistan. Uh, I am personally fascinated by the calm with which India has responded to the Afghan situation. Uh, normally, you would have expected some neurosis. Uh, oh, Americans have dumped the Afghans, they're going away, and what will happen now? But it's a different situation. So what exactly has happened in Afghanistan? Uh, how does it affect India? How do we analyze? We understand America's motivations. Uh, although, I think I was also tempted to say this morning, every day I uh, save my life by not saying 
10 things I want to say. But I wanted <laughs> to say that, that the US Taliban peace deal has had a shorter shelf life even than the Indian left liberals love for Arvind Kejriwal. Right? <laughs> I didn't say it. But can I just, sure. you know, for me, India has a Pakistan problem. It doesn't have an Afghanistan problem. You know, for a long but time. But not this Afghanistan problem. Even in many, for a long time, people have been saying, oh, you know, Afghanistan will go down the tubes and we're going to be hit. We don't get hit. There's Pakistan between us and Afghanistan. Exactly. Pakistan gets Talibanized, not Afghanistan no, gets But Pakistan before that, Pakistan has to settle the Durand line. Look at how few, how many Afghan terrorists have we seen in India? One in 40 years. Yes. Why are we yelling and screaming? We got a free war. The U.S. fought our war against the extremists for 19 years. We got it for free. Say thank you. If they want to go home, why should we be stopping them? So I don't understand why people panic about what's going on in Afghanistan. Afghanistan itself will evolve. It is different exactly. today from where yeah. it was in 2001. There's no question. That's what Jay Shankar and also said yesterday, that yeah, this is not the same Afghanistan. No, it might revert to historical type where, you know, power gets distributed down to various regional, whatever, leaders, tribal, etc., regional warlords, whatever, with a weak Kabul, which is the traditional pattern. But it's the one country that's never had a separatist movement. It's full of minorities, and it's never actually, because everybody else has an interest in Afghanistan <laughs> existing. The Iranians don't want all those Baluchis on their hands. The Pakistanis don't want the Bahans. <clears throat> and, and so on and so forth. I mean, it's so, I, frankly, I'm not sure why we should be so worried. We should worry about the real problem, which is Pakistan, which is not a problem that we have the power or capacity to solve, that the world's greatest power tried working on education on various good things in Pakistan, didn't work. Uh, the Chinese are now running up with CPEC. They, they see the problems in what they're doing. So. That's the problem we should focus on, to my mind. Rather than getting so involved in, oh, will the peace work? Will the Taliban keep their word? Of course they won't. But the, since the president needs to get out of Afghanistan, he will act as if they did keep their word. And he'll go home. Yeah, and certainly. let's live with it. <laughs> I mean, I, you know, first of all, this is one. There are a lot of issues that are controversial between Trump and the opposition. May I say this is one that's not controversial. There, there, there are no Americans for staying. Um, it's just you know we've done what we can, and I think that people have have. You can so debate. this is this is like Vietnam seventy three. It is it, it yeah. is in that sense. I mean I think that that there is a sense it is different. We did make a difference in some ways. We didn't accomplish everything we wanted, but we certainly recognize the limits of what we can accomplish. And so it's unrealistic to ask Americans to continue to sacrifice for something where we no longer are able to make much of a difference. I think there's some debate in the United States about whether we could have been more engaged with the Afghan government in this process. I mean, I do feel I'm not directly involved, but I do feel that there was a certain level of sort of, you know, indifference to their views. Understand that they could not have a veto over our leaving. We were going to make that decision, but I still think there were ways to be more respectful of them as a, as a partner in this rather than as an afterthought. Nevertheless, it wouldn't have made a big difference in any event because there's a limit to what the Taliban would have accepted in terms of engaging with Ghana. So I think the, the question now becomes thinking about this is a reality that we're coming out. What do we together need to do to deal with what, what the situation will be afterwards, which I think is an important partnership, um, that we need to sustain that. But accepting the reality that there, is not, there isn't an option of anything other than the United States withdrawing. And the question is, how do we then manage it? I think you're absolutely right. And, I'm looking for and frankly, I think the, the other powers around Afghanistan will now have to step up and take responsibility to do some of the things that, that the U.S. was doing for them, free. Yeah. Well, I mean, it, it's very interesting that you said Afghanistan is a country of minorities because I used to cover Afghanistan as a reporter. And the fascinating thing about, about Afghanistan is that for every tribe or community that's find, found there, there's a larger number in the adjoining right. country. <laughs> <laughs> So it's, it's a unique uh, uh, country. So uh, questions from the audience, please raise your hand and ask a question uh, in the back first. Let's start from the back. Uh, please introduce yourself and ask a short question. Thank you. 
Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Vishnu Priya. I'm a research fellow with the British Council and University of Oxford. Uh, my question is primarily directed towards Professor Menon. Like you rightly pointed out, our strategic relationship with the United States is crucial. But seeing President Trump's increased personal economic investment, his non-committal attitude between picking between India and Pakistan, calling them both friends, how difficult is it going to be to maintain a measured distance from the United States to pursue our domestic and foreign policy in India's interests, specifically with regard to India protecting its poultry and dairy industry, which has been a long-standing grouse and tariffs as well? Well, you know, I think the economic issues, a lot depends on our making up our own mind about how engaged we want to be with the world. The signs are not good recently. We opted out of our CP, we've raised customs duties for the last four years, etc., etc. But that's the choice that we have to make, and then we'll choose. And because we know how important the relationship is with the US, I hope that it actually leads us to the right decisions on the economic side. So that's a hard one to predict. I, I don't want to predict. But on the Pakistan thing that you mentioned, frankly, once the US withdraws from Afghanistan, U.S. interest or need for Pakistan declines considerably. And that was one difference when, you know, even in the past, we've seen this happen before, where you shed this millstone of the U.S. reliance on Pakistan. India-U.S. relations do very well. So, in fact, that's a good, another reason, actually, to welcome what's, what's going on in Afghanistan. Actually, that's a question that I will follow up on. Is a better... Both of you. Uh, is a better U.S.-Pakistan relationship good for India, or is a strained U.S.-Pakistan relationship good for India? You know, I, th I think it's good it, that, that in, it's in India's interest that we have some relationship with Pakistan. I mean, it, it's... I think it, we should have some yeah. relationship with Pakistan. <laughs> <laughs> I too. Uh, and, I, and I think that, you know, our level of influence is fairly modest. I mean, we, we've certainly come to understand that over the years. And, uh, I think I, you know, I work for several presidents who've tried very hard uh, to find ways, as uh, Shankar suggested, in terms of investing in economic development, energy development, and, and the like in Pakistan as, as a way of trying to build confidence that we have more than an instrumentalized relationship with Pakistan. It hasn't worked very well, right? And, and you know, I think we shouldn't turn our backs. We have humanitarian interests. We have interests in not having Pakistan completely fall apart. But, um, but I don't think it's in anybody's interest for Pakistan to feel abandoned by others. And certainly, I, I don't want to get into too much geostrategic competition, but it's, there's some value in Pakistan not being totally dependent on China for everything, right? I mean, it, 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 it is in everybody's interest that Pakistan have options in that respect. Well, I come at it the other way. For me, best dehyphenation, because that gives you free to deal with the issues as they arise. And you pick and choose what you do. You choose with the U.S., work together. It, it frees you, in a sense. Uh, but if, as we have done in the last few years, you choose to hyphenate, then certainly some U.S. influence, but I think we need to know that there are limits to how far that works. We know the nature of Pakistan. And as I keep saying, it's a Pakistan problem for us. It's not a problem that you can solve through the U.S. or through China or through anything else. Ultimately, we have to deal with it. And it's time, you know, 70 years after partition, it's time to grow up, I think. I, th I think <coughs> just, I mean, if I can add a line to that, the, for us, the Pakistan problem also is that Pakistan has got hyphenated with Indian domestic politics. So that has That's not become is. a complication. Ma'am, you, and because the question you asked in the back about dairy and agriculture, Please also remember that while you protect these industries, dairy and poultry, essentially, there is also someone at the other end of this equation who is much more numerous, and that is the consumer. Correct. So, uh, so if consumer is the king, then markets should be allowed to be freer than they are. That's my view. Not. My name is Rouse, and I'm the CEO of Clavelli Lectures. One very crucial question is that India, what is India's role in negotiating the Iranian nuclear deal, especially after, in the aftermath of uh, General uh, Soleimani's assassination? And that leads into how these 
particularly changes in internal Indian security policies, will be viewed by the um, uh, Indo-American policy watchers, you know, who will po possibly create the new uh, foreign policy, perhaps with a democratic uh, president. So, I mean, I, I think the Shankar's earlier comment about Iran is a very important one, which is that, you know, it, it is, the U.S. policy has to be mature enough to recognize that even our, our global comprehensive strategic partners don't always agree with us, and they have interests which are not identical with ours. And I think that something, you know, I spent a lot of time dealing with the Iran issue, not so much directly, directly with Iran, but with our partners, Japan, which has considerable interest in Iran, India, and others. And, you know, I, when I first came back um, in, uh, to the Obama administration, you know, and I, I, one of my early trips was to Japan, and I met with my Japanese counterparts, and I said, how can you do this, right? You know, we're trying to put pressure on Iran, and you're still... And they said, you know, we get it, right? But we have our own imperatives here. We have to find a way to try to be respectful of each other's interests here. And, you know, friends treat friends with respect, even if they disagree. And I think that that's, we learned that over the course of this, which is, and that we ended up getting much better cooperation from India on this when we stopped being, you know, <coughs> insistent that it's our way or the highway. And so I think that that, you know, this is, we are a big and powerful country, but we also need others to work with us, which means we have to be more accommodative. And we get into trouble when we unilaterally do things like withdraw from the JCPOA and then insist that everybody else go with us, right? I, I don't agree with the decision to withdraw, but even if we were going to withdraw, we have to respect the fact that others don't share that view. And so this is, it's important for the United States in terms of our own global leadership that we have strong views. We, we will try to be persuasive with others about that. But we have to find ways to, to accommodate the situations when our persuasion fails. Question in the back, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, my name is Prachur, and I, my question is for Mr. Steinberg and hmm, Shekhar Gupta. Not uh, for me, not for me. You ask, ask them questions. Okay. <laughs> uh, so my question is regarding the Green New Deal Maybe next. and how it has uh, animated at least the Democrat politics in and maybe uh, Bernie Sanders' rise. Uh, so I want to sort of understand what can India learn and Indian parties maybe learn from the Green New Deal? It's a very complicated question because <clears throat> the Green New Deal, it, it's the Green and the New Deal. And there, there's an overlap between the Green part and there's a not an overlap. And the, the, the set of policies that are incorporated within the Green New Deal address a range of things which are only loosely related to each other. There's a green agenda, which is quite important, and there's a economic transformation agenda that has to do with inequality and the structure of, of the U.S. economy agenda. And some of them appeal to different parts of the different constituencies, which is why um, the, the broad concepts are broadly uh, accepted within the Democratic Party, but a lot of the specific proposals are not because Many of them are more status than a lot of Democrats feel, uh, and many of them are, are frankly unrealistic in our political system and, and are more kind of campaign oriented rather than practical governance issues. So I think that there's, there's a core of principles behind it, which is that we need more environmentally friendly policies, we need more worker friendly policies, we need to deal with some of the fundamental inequality, structural inequalities in, in our society, which are shared broadly within the Democratic Party, but a lot of division about the specific proposals that are contained in that, you know, manifesto. It's a question, but I think this was showing 15 minutes, and now it's showing zero. zero. So it, okay, two more questions. Okay, uh, the gentleman here, because we haven't had enough questions from this side. Yeah, right, so I saw one hand, uh, your hand, yes. After yeah. that, please pass the microphone sure. to her. Good afternoon. Uh, Binay here from Takshashila School of Public Policy. Uh, my question uh, is bit, about... A little bit louder and closer to the microphone. Yeah. Aren't we underestimating the structural change in terms of deglobalization over the last decade around the world in terms of be it Brexit or the sentiment in Italy and Southern European nations against EU, the sentiment in the United States also against in integration with the rest of the world. So Trump or Brexit, this represent the structural underlying forces against deglobalization. So could you, if you could address that, thanks. I think, you know, coronavirus showed you that we're still a globalized world. <laughs> I mean, you've seen the effect. You've seen what's happened to your stock market, to 
you know, I think there is no decoupling. We might say deglobalization, but if you look at the proportion of world trade to GDP, that's bad. We're now back to 2008 levels, actually. We went down, but we're back up. Yes, the U.S. and China are onshoring production, U.S. at, at the higher, you know, very high value-added levels, China at some of the lower levels. Uh, and those production chains have shrunk over the last few years, since 2008, actually. So it's not so much the deglobalizers as the crisis in 2008. But there's only limited scope, I think, for them to actually decouple from the world. And we see this in every relationship, that the dependence on each other is tremendous. Look at us. 80% of our imports are maintenance imports. You will have to buy energy, oil. You will have to buy fertilizer. You buy moong dal. I mean, you're not going to survive without these things. So for me, this is not going to be a deglobalized world. You're not going all the way back. You might evolve into a differently globalized world, but not, what do you think? I'm a little more pessimistic, I have to say. I mean, part of the reason I, I actually share. I'm an share, old man. I'm not going to be here when all this happens. <laughs> little um, less optimistic. You know, I, uh, and part of the reason, I mean, I, I do share a lot of your concerns. And part of the reason we didn't address it here is because uh, Ambassador Sarn and I talked about it at some length yesterday. Um, I am worried about the renationalization. And I, and I, I regrettably, I think that the, the, what's happening with the coronavirus is actually accentuating that. Because what people are saying now is that there's too much vulnerability and we're seeing global supply chains being disrupted by coronavirus. So the best way to do this is to insulate ourselves and to renationalize production. I mean, even most dramatically in, in terms of active pharmaceutical ingredients, right, which we're now very dependent on China. And people say, oh my God, you know, we, we can't do that. And, you know, so, I mean, I agree with you that there's a limit to how far this can go, but I think there's an, an awful lot of momentum behind this that is looking at vulnerabilities and looking at risks and looking at costs. And it's the left and the right. I mean, this is one place where the left in the United States and the right agree, which is that we're too exposed and there are too many costs to American society. And so I think that there are going to be a lot of strains. And I think that the, the backlash against these vulnerabilities, and, and some of which are inherent in globalization, some of which is because we manage globalization badly. But I do see, I mean, it's not going to be pure decoupling. But there's, there's going to be an awful lot of energy put into these reconceptualizations that, that see the risks rather than the benefits. And I think it's very dangerous. I mean, one, it's going to have a huge impact on global growth. I, I think, you know, we're already in a question that Larry Summers has raised about, you know, what the future of growth is. And this is going to hurt this even more. But worse, it leads to a much more zero-sum conception of everybody's interest. And, and, and coupling that with America first, Britain first, Brexit, as you say, and other things, you know, it, it creates a much more volatile international environment. I mean, yesterday the argument was, well, even globalization didn't prevent World War I. That's true. But imagine without these interconnections how much more fragile the situation would be. Well, I mean, my experience, that, uh, all, I think many would agree that the ideas on which the left and the right both agree most strongly are the worst ideas. <laughs> Sir, I'm Vipul Jain from JNU, U.S. Oh, uh, I think we'll, uh, okay, it's okay. okay. We'll, we'll take, no, we'll take, go ahead, last question. My question is for, one question is for Steinberg, sir. Uh, uh, closer to you. The current economic slowdown caused by the coronavirus in China, do you think it will uh, make China vulnerable in the U.S.-China uh, ongoing trade talks? And for Manon, sir, does this current slowdown in China offer an economic opportunity for India to grow closer to the U.S. economically? You know, I think it's very hard to say because it's, it's not clear to me what the administration's ultimate objectives are in the trade talks, right? I mean, if you look at the interim agreement, I mean, it's a very shallow agreement. It, 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 it produces some, some near-term benefits for the United States, but it doesn't go to some fundamental questions. You know, and I think that ultimately the, there are some, we have some leverage over China under these circumstances, but... You know, I would like to see it leveraged around really systemic addressing of the problems in the way China runs its economy, which is not just a bilateral U.S.-China relationship. It has to do much more with China's role in the global trading system, trade and investment system, and that we ought to be working more closely with other partners to try to define the terms about sort of revitalizing uh, the rules-based system rather than just trying to get short-term deals for us out of this, which actually weakens the overall system. To, to the other question, does, can India replace China? 
in the U.S. in the economic terms. I'm not so sure because, A, you need to match factor costs in China, which are low. And everything you're doing actually is raising those, whether it's land, whether it's capital, whether it's the cost of all these in India today. And even labor is not cheap because productivity is so low. So I'm not sure that you can do it. And it's not automatic. None of this will just happen automatically because of what happens between China and the US. So for me, if you want to do that, you'd better step up your game. You have to. There's a lot of things that we need to do. Well, I think we have to conclude this. All I can tell you is for India to decide, first of all, to take advantage of this. The cabinet has to decide. Then a group of secretary has to present a paper. <laughs> Niti Aayog will examine it. It will go back to the cabinet as a cabinet note. Then a group of will be set up. By that time, this crisis hopefully will be over. <laughs> it will be good for all of us. So thank you very much. It's been a wonderful session. Uh, and a special applause of both our both our panelists who've been so disciplined and so clear-headed. So once again, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.